time is it there? Midnight. Okay, it's live. It says we're live. Hello, hello. <laughs> it's, um, uh, uh, what time is it? It's four o'clock Pacific, five o'clock here in Costa Rica, seven o'clock on the East Coast, midnight in Dublin and in Lisbon, 1 a.m. in Rome, 8.30 and 9.30 a.m. Wednesday morning in Australia. 9.30 a.m. in New Zealand, and it's Facebook Live. Hello, everyone. And you know, to start off with, I have three very special guests today. Uh, my first and most important guest is my wife. The second most important guest is our baby, Gio. Today, yeah, I'm sorry, Jean-Pedro, but you're number three here, man. Uh, today is Gio's eight-month Today is Gio's eight -month birthday. We just celebrated wow. his eight month birthday. And uh, he's just, he, he had um, filet, mignon, and octopus for his birthday cake wow. today. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and of course, our special guest is my dear friend, Don Pedro um, uh, in Lisbon, who is the executive director of the third International Conference on Healthy Aging, which is occurring this coming weekend. And okay, bye-bye. 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 It's, it's bedtime for Gio, he's waving goodbye. <laughs> so this weekend um, in Lisbon, and I leave on Thursday morning to fly to Lisbon. It's my first travel um, in, uh, uh, since March of 2020. Uh, I have not been on an airplane in a year and a half, and usually I fly um, 150,000 miles a year. So I'm excited to uh, get back on the road and stand in front of an audience again. Uh, I'm not happy to leave my family, but that's okay. That's okay. We'll make do. I'm going. <coughs> Excuse me. Right. Excuse yeah. me. Thank you so much. So um, let's begin, Jean Pedro, and tell us, tell the audience a little about this conference and why this conference is happening. Well, good evening to all of you. Good morning. Good afternoon, according to the to the time zone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, and an honor to count on your participation again. It's the second time you are joining us as the scientific committee member uh, of the International Healthy Aging uh, Summit brand that it's going to, to take place in its first edition. And in, a, in addition, this year's edition, you will be taughting the, the first uh, post-summit uh, course. Um, why uh, do we have uh, this Congress uh, joining uh, so many backgrounds in a multidisciplinary approach uh, from so many countries around the world, uh, because we believe in the, in the multidisciplinarity of, uh, in order to, to create um, patient-focused cares and healthcare services in order to make people gain quality of life instead of dealing with diseases or with um, situations that are supposed to be normal uh, to have and to face since you have a certain um, a certain amount of age. The Let healthy aging you, is what, about... What, yes. what does it mean? What does it mean, healthy aging? What is it that well, we're trying uh, to... I'd like to do it in a in an opposite way, if you don't mind. What is not healthy aging? Healthy aging, it's not for older people. That's the first thing to, to be said. Actually, I had the opportunity to say that uh, for a national uh, a TV station during the, the beginning of the first edition, when we talked about healthy aging. Healthy aging has nothing to do with older people. Actually, when we get when we are born, we are starting a, a, an aging process and as well as you deal with it since the very early uh, phases and stages of your life certainly you will have a, a better aging along your whole life and most part of it when you get older that's that's totally uh, absolute um with with any kind of doubt 
The second point is we don't like anti-aging uh, because we are not anti-anything. Aging is good, it's a, it's a sign that we are alive. And if we, we are alive and if we are healthy and even more, if we are happy, well, perfect. I think that's what we all look forward to be and, and, and well, and that's it. So we try to incorporate knowledge from all the healthcare practitioners that challenged themselves in order to give to themselves the opportunity to give to their patients more and risking uh, to, to, to mess a little bit with the status quo and searching for new answers for pre-established problems. And I think you are all uh, totally in, you, you all deserve a huge congratulations for all your work and for being changing lives. And it's super inspiring to count on your participation and contribute scientifically speaking when we talk about the summit and all the slots that we have in the panel. Thank so uh, it's Let's all about, yes. Uh, this is very informal, this, this time together. And I always like to acknowledge people that are here. So Quincy was the first person here today saying hello. Uh, Dorada is, hello Dorada, uh, saying hello. Nuno is here. Bon Natale from Algar Algarve, A-L-G-A-R-V-E. I don't know that area. Yes. Nuno. Okay. It's uh, in the south. In the south. Algarve, Quincy I've just wrote it. Quincy uh, says, happy eight months, sweet boy. Thank you, Quincy. Wanda's here from Long Island. Cheryl O'Brien, wow, time flies, eight months. Hello again from Wellington, Florida. Hi, Cheryl. Uh, Lucia is here from Tucson. Laura's here from Oregon. Laura's on our team, part of the doctor.com. Hi, Laura. Thank you. Uh, Melissa's here from Virginia, and she has a question. What can a low platelet count mean with all other labs appear to be normal? MPV has been elevated off and on in the past, but couldn't figure out what it meant. Low platelet counts, you might want to consider vitamin T. T is in Tom. It's not one that's very often talked about. It's uh, high in sesame oil. And there's a few studies that I've seen that in low platelet counts, increasing your sesame oil, maybe in your salad dressing, things like that. I don't know if it makes a difference if you're cooking with it or if you have it raw. I've recommended it raw in the past, but that often will help with low platelets. There are many, many reasons why you have low platelets. Can't get into that now, but just a little pearl about, try some sesame oil, see if that helps. Um, let's see, Karen's here from Florida. Karen Bartley is watching. Uh, Kathleen Cousins is watching. Nuno says, what is the link for the Congress? We will post the link for the Congress. And thank you, Nuno, because not only can you register for the event in person, it's also being live streamed. So we will post the link here for the live stream that's going to occur. And on Sunday, the conference is on Friday and Saturday. And on Sunday, the post-conference, I'm doing the full eight-hour day on the Certified Gluten-Free Practitioner Program and how we as representative of a food can contribute to and be the trigger in the development of autoimmune diseases. And there's over 350 studies I'm doing and that in itself is worth registering for the conference. Uh, let alone we have Professor Yehuda Schoenfeld from Israel, the godfather of autoimmunity. He's the man that I've learned so much from over the years. We have Professor Alessio- He's coming in person. He's in, person. in person, yeah. you know, that's right. That's marvelous. Unless you won't be able to, to join us in person, but he already sent us the, his pre-recorded content. Marvelous. Uh, yes, marvelous. sorry to interrupt you. A yes, number marvelous. of functional medicine practitioners and integrative medicine practitioners from Europe and... Uh, um, uh, uh, Portugal, Spain, France. Spain and Brazil. Isn't there someone coming from Brazil? And we also have our experts on uh, gut modulation. Marvelous. Intestinal Marvelous. Mod modulation, yes. Muriel Pereira, nutritionist, yes. Maggie's here from Cleveland. Uh, I see the link is being posted now for the event. Uh, so Nuno, there it is for you and for everyone else. And um, if you or your friends have been wanting to know more about, um, look, look at the, the, 
the homepage, look at all the speakers that are coming, listening to Professor Schoenfeld, just listening to him speak, people always walk away with a couple of ahas that they never thought about before, ever, ever. I'll give you an example. In 2016, I interviewed him for Betrayal, our docuseries, and he is in Betrayal. And his book had just come out, Vaccines and Autoimmunity. And I asked him, so Professor Schoenfeld, what is this thing about vaccines for children and harming children? And he looked at me and he said, we very much support the idea of vaccines in general. However, if the person carries the gene HLA-DRB1, really simple gene to test for, if they carry that gene, they're very much at risk of having a bad reaction to the adjuvant in the vaccine. Now, an adjuvant is the thing that they put in vaccines to irritate the system so that the immune system recognizes, hey, something's just come in and irritated us. And so to activate an immune response, and most commonly it's been mercury or aluminum as the adjuvant. And if you carry the gene HLA-DRB1, simple, inexpensive gene to test for, if you carry that gene, his comment was caution is advised in administering vaccines to children. Those, especially if parents choose to do vaccines, those people are the one you give a child one vaccine at a time, not three or four, one. You wait two, three, four weeks, give them one more. As opposed to most every child that gets vaccines gets three or four at once. And their immune system is already not fully developed yet. And so you're traumatizing the system with adjuvant from three or four vaccines, which is a bigger trauma, and you increase the risk of having an adverse reaction. Those are the kinds of comments and ideas that Professor Schoenfeld will be sharing. So the price of admission to this is so um, uh, reasonable that just to hear him speak and maybe hear me speak or a couple of the others would be just marvelous. So the link is now there for you. Connie says, hi, Dr. Tom from sunny, hot North Carolina. Amal's here from Marina Del Rey. Angie says, hello from lockdown Australia. God bless you. Thank you, Angie, and to you too. Hold tight there. And Tam's here from Alberta, Canada. Tracy's in South Carolina. Julie's in the Hamptons, Long Island. Susanna says, missed you last week. Yes, so sorry. Came back from Oahu, Hawaii. My eyes haven't stopped burning since. I'm on a million supplements and I have MS. I just can't stay ahead of the game of aging. What do you suggest? A comprehensive functional medicine practitioner that gets the big picture overview. You know, I gave a talk earlier today uh, uh, to a group and I talked about, you need a map. You need a map to understand what's happening in your body. And I put up a map of the railway system in New Delhi. And, and you see how sophisticated the railways, if you want to get here, you have to go here, change trains, go over here, change trains, and then you go up. You need the map to get to where you want to go. So that's the first thing. But you can't use a map for New Delhi if you live in New York. You need the map of New York, meaning you can't take a package program for diabetes and expect everyone's going to fit in that program that it has to be unique to the individual. So if you already have a diagnosis of an autoimmune disease, I would suggest you work with the team at the doctor.com or some other very competent healthcare practitioner. But that's the concept. You need a map of what's going on in your body so you can identify specifically the target of where you've got to go and then how to get there. You can't use a map of New Delhi if you live in New York. Okay, let's move on. Uh, Connie says, looking forward to seeing that handsome son of yours. Oh, Connie, I'm sorry, he, he was here at the start. So you'll have to come back and uh, um, uh, watch the beginning uh, after we're done to see him. Uh, today was his eight month birthday, but now he's off to bed already. So Jean Pedro, let's take a moment now and talk about who some of the other guests are. Uh, the speakers who are coming and what their topic is that they're going to be talking about. 
well, we have so many to talk about that. <laughs> I don't know even from where to, to begin, but I think that we should start from the beginning, right? So the opening session, the, the opening session lecture, lecture will be delivered by the, the World Health Organization uh, representative, which is our guest of honor, Dr. Anshu Banerjee. Um, which is responsible for the, the aging department from World Health, Health Organization. Let me just uh, pause, I pause you for a minute so that everybody understands what you just said. The World Health Organization is sending their director of the aging division of the World Health Organization to our conference to give the opening talk on what healthy aging is. That in itself, everyone should hear about what's happening in the world, which helps us see what's happening in our lives and what their ideas are as how to support healthy aging. Excuse me for the interruption, but I want people to understand. No, 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 not at all. Okay. Yes, of course, I, I understood. So that's super honoring for all of us uh, from the committee, scientific committee. And we started, as you know, because you are following this from the, the very first, the, the uh, we started uh, communicating about this summit even in December, if uh, I think you remember, right? Yeah. <laughs> and you you saw this child uh, growing and and joining all the people together from so many different countries. And uh, our perspective was we want the best of the best for this edition and as worldwide as possible. So let's start from the best ones. And we have yes, 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 from all of them. And then when I talk to our dear friend Filomena, if she's seeing us, please send, receive a big, big kiss to you. I don't know if she's there uh, seeing us or not. And Filomena said, what else do you want? <laughs> you want more uh, members? You think it's enough? What do you think it's the, the proper? But more than too much or too, much, too less, we were very focused. We, we had very clear on, my, on our minds that we needed to create a focus for this edition. So we decided to talk about immune system and autoimmunity. It ends because there are two very important realities the immune system um, is, is super compromised along our aging process if we don't take care about ourselves and about our defenses or about the things that can put in risk our defenses. So it's, all, it's kind of obvious, obvious not to talk about it. And autoimmunity, because it's super complex, it's growing a lot uh, in the first world uh, reality. And uh, most part of the people, uh, most part of the times, they do not recognize an autoimmune disease as an autoimmune disease. And it's first symptoms and the, obviously the decreasing of the quality of life of the people and obviously the, the strategy, strategies that we find in the, in the most conventional approach uh, in, our, in our daily basis and in the clinical practice in general. So why not talk in a, in a proactive approach about these two, these very important two areas and bring them um, up to the scenario of this summit edition and putting people from Portugal, as you mentioned, references on integrative medicine, functional medicine, anti-aging medicine, as well as healthcare professionals from very different areas and backgrounds from, Sp from Spain, from France, from Italy, from Israel, as you mentioned, and from uh, the US, of course, and from Brazil. And the, 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 the other curious thing is that we also decided to involve in this summit edition, a second room, um, uh, dedicated to all that has to do with non-conventional therapies, uh, therapeutics, sorry. And what do they have to say about healthy aging, immune system and autoimmunity? So since we are, we are having two different rooms uh, in between the Friday afternoon and the Saturday morning, 
all the people registered in this summit edition will be able to review all the contents for five uh, days after the end of the activities. So we are talking about two uh, super, super intensive days, uh, 19 um, hours in one room and 10 hours in another one. Oh, no. And obviously an international certificate by the way, with all your signatures, we already have yours from the last edition for the certificate. I don't know if you remember, but we must ask for the rest of the scientific committee members for their signatures to, to fill the certificates and to be sent to all of you. So it's super challenging. We are in a, in we are still in a pandemic or living a pandemic state. As you mentioned, it's going to be our first trip. We could not feel more honored because of that. Taking you, uh, come on, come and do your first trip to Portugal. Thank you so much for honoring us for that. Thank and you. we are all um, trying to restart all the things that we had before, but it's been very, very challenging, <laughs> as you know. I am really surprised that you have maintained your hair color. <laughs> that you haven't turned gray because I know all of the work you've been doing for so many months. Um, and I just want to tell people, you just don't know all of the back room stuff that goes on in an event like this uh, in between the hotels and the government and transportation and travel agencies and the speakers. <laughs> trying to get all the speakers to do what they need to do on time is like herding cats. You know, you can't hurt. So I'm surprised that your hair hasn't turned a little closer to my color. <laughs> but According to this perspective, no, <laughs> let's keep it like that. The, the importance of this type of an event, this event and this type of event is because we're showing the World Health Organization what the science is behind functional medicine that we have great speakers here this weekend, this coming weekend, and we're gonna show them the science. Uh, I'm doing my uh, individual talk, which has, I think it's 29 studies in it. And I don't remember if I'm speaking for 60 minutes or 90 minutes, uh, but there's 29 studies. 60. 60, okay. Uh, then I have to talk fast <laughs> with the 29 studies. And then on Sunday, my event is over 350 studies that I will be talking about. So I'm excited that we have such a senior representative of the World Health Organization who's come on their own nickel because the pharmaceutical companies are not paying him to come here. You know, there's, there's no one sponsoring him. And so they're coming because Jean Pedro had the idea, I'm going to reach out to them and see if they will endorse our event and they have and they're sending their um, senior representative for healthy aging which is just very exciting so i'm really yes excited to, uh, have that occur we talked about that we started the contacts actually with the united nations remember yes, because uh, for the people that are hearing us now we are also in line with a very very important strategic document which is called healthy uh, decade of healthy aging 2021-2030 uh, and it's kind of um, a guidebook uh, with the most strategic uh, areas and uh, topics that we must take in account in the very next years when we talk about healthy aging around the world and it's widely corroborated by the world health organization and since the United Nations document, it's more like a formal or politician document and less practice or strategically put it on in the, in the field. We decided to reendorse the, the, the invitation not to the, to the United Nations, but to the World Health Organization. And, and they said they accepted, and we have the, the director of the, the aging department from That's the marvelous, really this marvelous. important institution, and it's absolutely unique. I never been in a in a congress with a representative from the World Health Organization. Never, <laughs> it's my first time. So it will be exciting, very exciting. Uh, yes. we have the question. rest of the program. 
Yes. Uh, Angie asked, what causes tendons to tighten? Well, Angie, tendons don't have motor fiber, so they don't tighten. Uh, it's the muscles. See, muscles don't hook up into bones. Muscle fibers connect to tendons, first a little bit, then more and more and more, until now it's a tendon-muscle combination, and then over here it's all tendon. But the tendon doesn't have any motor fiber, so it doesn't tighten or loosen. It's the muscles that are doing that. It's, so it's not the tendons. And so you have to look at what's causing the muscles to tighten, and that's mechanical. There are many, many triggers for that. First thing I would do is recommend find a good chiropractor uh, to work with those muscles to find out why they're tightening on you. But if someone's telling you your tendons are tightening, that's impossible, it doesn't occur. The muscles tighten and they pull the tendon. So it looks like the tendon is tightening, but it can't. There's no motor fibers in tendons, you know, only in muscles. So it's the muscle that's pulling the tendon. If it pulls too much, starts to come off the bone a little bit, causing swelling. And that's what shin splints are, if it's in your legs or in other areas, or I, I don't know if there's other names for it in other areas, but the, uh, the inflammation and the pain and tenderness is caused by the muscle pulling on the tendon. R a really important distinction. Shanquila says, what does it mean to have vertical lines, ridges on your fingernails? Didn't always have these and curious what it means. Well, there's a number of things that it can mean, uh, Shanquila. It's called transverse leukonychia, geek word, you know, transverse leukonychia, and associated with deficiencies like uh, pellagra, which is a vitamin B3 deficiency, or low calcium levels, a deficiency of calcium. Uh, it's also associated with overabundance of too much iron in the blood, such as in hemochromatosis. So you, you need to work with someone that knows why is this happening, and then go down the checklist. Is it this? Is it a B vitamin deficiency? Is it a calcium insufficiency? Is it, uh, wh where is it coming from? Is it too much iron, hemochromatosis? Uh, but you have to look into that because some of those conditions can have a number of other effects. So um, don't think that the transverse lines on your nails, are, well, the lines on my nails, not a big deal. No, 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 no. It's like a temperature gauge that's in the hot zone saying your engine's overheating, okay? So make sure you look at that. Uh, Renee asks, which gene was that? H-L-A-D-R-B-1, H-L-A-D-R-B-1. Not expensive to test for, but that's the gene that says that person's likely gonna be sensitive to the adjuvant in vaccines. So um, let's move on to what healthy aging looks like. For each of you in the audience today, what do you think? of healthy aging. When you think of healthy aging, how do you envision yourself in the very best scenario possible? Write in some comments of the very best possible scenario 10 years from now, 15 years from now, 20 years from now, not based on how you're functioning today, but rather in your wildest dreams, how would you like to function in 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, meaning healthy aging. What would that look like for you? And for each of us, it's different. But as we see some of the comments, Jean Pedro and I can make some uh, observations about that and which of the speakers this weekend might touch on some of those topics. For example, let me ask Jean Pedro, I'm sorry, I just don't remember. Is Graham on the um, speaking list this year from uh, England? No, no. Graham, Graham is from South Africa and he is. Um, and he's not with us this year. He, okay. he, but he was in the in the first and in the second edition. Right. We are right. talking about the 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 the, the chronime, the right. integral chronime from him. Right. Okay. It's super interesting. We talked about that already. Yes. And what is the topic that Felicia will be talking on? Who is an excellent speaker, my colleague at IFM. She's on faculty at IFM, and uh, when she speaks, she has this very soft voice. And she, she doesn't speak with a lot of power or volume like I do, uh, but the room <laughs> is, you, you could hear a pin drop when she's speaking because she really knows what she's talking about. What's her topic this year? 
are we talking about? Sorry. Uh, what topic is Felicia going to talk about this year? Alicia Fazano? No, no, uh, F Felicia. Felicia, let me see. Felicia, where did you find Felicia? We don't have any Felicia, I'm sorry. <laughs> where did you saw? I think you, did you see? I'll, I'll I think not. I'll, I'll come back to you on that one. Uh, Susan's here. So from we have. Go ahead, go ahead. Sorry, we have Anna Kabeka from the US. Anna, great. I great. think it's Anna that you were trying to mention, right? And what topic and is Anna she's, talking about? Anna is talking about keto, uh, menopause, and I'm sorry, I cannot know all of them by memory, but keto green 16 menopause and the relevant, uh, relevant topic in sexual health. Um, that's right. what she's going to be talking about. This is my friend, Dr. Anna Cabana, who is a uh, um, ob uh, a holistic ob -GYN. And she talks about topics related to women's health, especially as they're going towards the perimenopausal years. Not exclusively, she also works with younger women, of course, yes. and does great work. But her, her, her topic that I've heard her speak about a couple of times is on the perimenopausal years and how to make those as smooth um, as possible for an individual. And what, pick another speaker and the topic that they're going to be talking about. Well, we have so many. More than talk about the speaker in particular, I'd like to, to tell two things about the program. First, we are not only direct, we are not only focused on the professional, uh, for professionals uh, targets, but we are also available and, and very pleasured, by the way, for receiving uh, general public as well, okay? With interest on, on, on these kind of, of, of areas and obviously uh, knowledge, and we are super, super uh, open to receive them all, as well as students. Second, we have a very exclusive and specific panel during the Saturday morning, exclusively dedicated to clinical protocols. And we are going to start with our dear Filomena, uh, Dr. Filomena Trindar. She will be sharing with all of us our clinical protocol on autoimmunity. And she will also be uh, moderating the, 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 the sessions of, of, this, of this all morning. So we will have intermittent fasting, in, 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 the, in, the, in the area as, the, as one of the main focus of this summit, delivered by our dear uh, friends and my dear colleague, Dr. Alexandra Vasconcelos, a Portuguese pharmacist with, um, with clinics on the integrative medicine. Uh, we are also having a medical doctor cardiologist, Dr. Ana Rita Victor. She's going to talk about cardiovascular diseases on healthy aging which is a super important um, subject topic, but with the proper and with the correct focus. Because as we also seen, uh, Tom, in the last editions, uh, it's all about insulin resistance, as we all know. And it, it's gonna be super productive to hear directly from a cardiologist and to talk about the truly problem uh, behind the, the cardiovascular diseases uh, or its basis, uh, I would say its basis more than the, the main problem. And we have very specific topics. We also have dentistry, biological and integrative dentistry, which, which um, will be, we, we will all um, be able to, to hear about uh, in interferent fossi uh, in, our, in, our, in our mouth and how does it affect our health in general and obviously our autoimmunity. I'm, I'm super um, excited to hear a little more about the, 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 the dentistry um, medical uh, doctor that is going to deliver this plenary talk uh, during this, this uh, Friday afternoon. A super interesting topic as well is the fact that 
uh, in the previous editions, we used to have um, a psychologist and we decided to renew, uh, renew it. And we decided to put it on more like uh, in a high performance approach. So we decided to involve this year a coach, a super important coach with uh, extraordinary uh, results here in Portugal and all around the world because he he's he's working uh, and he's traveling always a lot since I understood from the, the few contacts that we had since the invitation and and he accepted to be uh, with us and we are going to talk about an amazing um, topic that excites me a lot too which has to do with high performance on healthy aging because most part of the times we assume that in the 40s, in the 50s, in the 60s, we no longer have age to do certain things or to think about certain things. And most part of the times, we self-limit ourselves a lot uh, in terms of main purposes of life, in terms of health conditions, in terms of a lot of, thi a lot, uh, of things. So I can't wait to hear more from a, a super, super, um credible um coach and professional to talk about uh, high performance on healthy aging so it's super complete tom we would be all the night here talking about the professionals and their backgrounds but what can i can i say most in the non-conventional therapeutics not to be talking exclusively about the panel the two complete days panel because we also have the second room as mentioned uh, before well, it's, it's surprising as well, because we are opening this room with the president of the um, natural medicine, uh, um, natural medicine as European association, um, Nora Lobstein. Uh, she's going to talk about non-conventional therapies, therapeutics in a European Union uh, approach in terms of challenges and, 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 and all that things as, as an opening session. We found as well a super interesting professional from traditional Chinese medicine from uh, China living in the US, Dr. Gu, um, a, a super inspiring person. I had the opportunity uh, to take a look a little bit of, of his recorded presentation. Actually, I would be, <laughs> I can't wait. I'm kind of looking at the computer and trying not to start seeing all the things that we are receiving from everybody because it's super <laughs> exciting with so many contents and we have so much to do till the day of the event that it's been challenging to not, try not to see the presentations from you all. By the way, I'm sorry to, to, to tell you, but please send us your presentation, okay? Oh, I <laughs> as soon as you can. It was sent yesterday. It was sent yesterday. Yes? Yeah. To Beatrice? Okay, uh, okay, 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 perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's in the inbox for you. Well, that's marvelous. Okay, that's really you. marvelous. And uh, uh, I'm going to... Uh, talk a little about my, my work on Sunday, my presentation on Sunday, I wanna give you just a taste of the type of information that we'll be giving. A, a study was published in March of last year from uh, Norway, and they looked at 86,306 children uh, in the Norwegian mother and child cohort study. Uh, it began in 1999 and it went to 2008. And they followed these 86,000 children all the way up to April 15th of 2018. And they were following them to see how many of them developed diabetes from the perspective of how much gluten they ate and they measured the hazard ratio. That was the term for it, meaning what's the likelihood, what's the hazard if you take in a certain amount of gluten uh, in your childhood or your infancy. And what they found was that there was an increased association. There was a 46% increased risk of developing type one diabetes by the age of seven for each 10 grams of gluten the child eats per day. 
Now, wow. one slice of whole wheat bread is about two to four grams. So 10 grams a day is three slices. So you get a sandwich and then maybe a piece of a toast at breakfast, that's 10 grams. For every 10 grams of gluten that a child eats in his first year and a half of life, increases the risk of developing type one diabetes by the time he's seven years old of 46%. And that's like, what? But they followed 86,000 children, 86,000 for 15 years. 86,000 86, children. So that's the kind of information I'm gonna talk about on Sunday as to why so many people have a problem with wheat. And I'm gonna talk about where it comes from, why it happens, what do you do about it? How do you test for it? How do you protect your children? How am I protecting Gio from developing problems with wheat? Cause he's gonna get wheat in his life, you know, not from us, but he goes to his friend's house to eat or something. You know, he's gonna be exposed. How do we protect him? What, what about the microbiome? How do you protect um, uh, so that you don't get so much inflammation? That's the Sunday, and all of this is in person, but also um, live stream. You can, and it's being recorded. Yes. It's being recorded, yes. so that you can watch it all. And yes, and the other part that I must thank you again is the fact that you are giving the opportunity to all the post summit course attendees to have a plus for dot uh, five continuing hours delivered directly by your platform, the doctor.com um with quizzes and with a final evaluation giving them access to your network and to all the, the, the to your database well but i think that should be you to to that's a to, good point. to be explaining that that's a good um, point i forgot to mention it for those that attend uh whether in person or live stream if you wish you then can get you'll get the link to the doctor.com our private page and if you wish you can take the quiz to become a certified gluten-free practitioner. And if you pass, if you don't pass, we say, you know what, you got question 14 wrong, go back and look at slides 18 through 32, and then answer it again. You know, that it's not necessary that you memorize all this stuff, it's just necessary that you have an understanding of it. But for people who have it's been- most important about, thing. You're very welcome to uh, pursue it further once you've attended the live stream or in person, the event. Jill has a question. How can I gain weight without eating oils and gluten? Of course, I started eating plant-based and added beans and rice, but my fiber consumption is already at 50 grams from the fruits and vegetables. I don't eat any junk food as it took me a long time to get off sugar. Love these podcasts, thank you. Well, thanks, Jill. So the first thing that I would do is evaluate your microbiome. Your microbiome determines how many calories you hoard and how many calories you lose. That, and I'll give you the example. We usually look at it from the other side. Why are people obese? And what do you do to help reduce their obesity? The example is the Pima Indians in the Southwest part of the United States. There's nothing but desert there. How did they survive for hundreds of years? You can't grow crops and there's not like lots of wild animals running around. It's rare, you know, to find a deer in the desert. How did they survive? They survived those that had a very efficient microbiome to hoard calories and use every calorie that they could take in and transform it and use it as food. They survived and they reproduced. And so their microbiome passed on to the next generation. Those that were inefficient at hoarding calories, they died from starvation. They just couldn't get enough food, right? So the Pima Indians have a uh, microbiome that is excessive in the bacteria that hoard calories called Firmicutes. It's the Firmicutes family that hoards calories. Now. Take the Pima Indians in the Southwest US and then right below the border in Mexico where it's still 
desert mountains, the same kind of terrain, but the desert mountains and terrain in Mexico, those Pima Indians are still eating the way their ancestors did a couple hundred years ago. Really simple, nothing fancy. But the Pima Indians in the Southwest United States have been eating reservation food and the Colonel's Kentucky Fried Chicken and Big Macs and all of these calorie rich but nutrient poor foods. What do you think has happened to the Pima Indians in the United States compared to their cousins that have the same genes of the, P the Pima Indians in Mexico? They have the same genes. They have the same microbiome originally, but the Pima Indians in the US have been eating garbage food now for generations. 50% of Pima Indians are obese and have type one diabetes, I'm sorry, type two diabetes by the age of 35. 50% of them are diabetic and large by the age of 35. But in Mexico, the same tribe of Indians, same genes, 5% are obese and have type two diabetes. 50%, 5%. And it's because the ones in the US keep eating the calorie rich, lots and lots of calories, but the nutrient poor food so the bacteria that are being fed are the bacteria that love calories. And, but the Pima Indians, their genetics say hoard calories, hoard calories, hoard calories. So they're hoarding calories and they get bigger and they develop diabetes. Whereas the Pima Indians in Mexico, they eat beans and rice and really simple root vegetables, not much at all. And only 5% of them are obese. So, now, Ten so time less, time it, less. It, it's the microbiome that has a great deal to determine in terms of your weight. So if you are trying to eat as much food as you can, healthy food, but you're not gaining weight and you feel you're underweight, you have to evaluate your microbiome. That's a first step in that one. Isn't it always in general? Well, there's no always, but trying to generalize the microbiome is super important, right? Yeah, it's critically and try important. try to establish the, the, the start to the starting point to do a reset or to change something, that's the, the starting point, right? right. Um, uh, Melissa wrote to Renee, said, Renee, it's HLA-DRB1. That's correct, Melissa, you, you got it right. Kim says, do bioidentical hormones help with aging? That's a really good question that Dr. Anna Cabana uh, Quebeca, Anna Quebeca will be Quebeca. answering uh, about healthy hormones. She's a strong advocate of healthy hormones and she'll explain her rationale uh, in the event. Luann says, what can I do for Charlie horses? I'm 64. Uh, well, if you, uh, Luann, I think you, if I remember you, you've got a mindset of 46. So you may be 64, but your mindset's 46. And Charlie horses, uh, those kind of cramps, Try this first, just try this. Do a bath one night and put two cups of Epsom salt in the water. Epsom salts is magnesium, pure magnesium. So just put it in the water and then go to sleep and see if you still have Charlie horses that night or the next day. If it seems to help, then you have to explore why is my magnesium so low? Now, there, there are a number of triggers for Charlie horses. It can be other minerals like potassium. That's a common one also. But it's a really easy, simple thing to do. Do a bath with two cups of Epsom salt. See what happens on that. Maggie says, Dr. Tom could talk for eight hours on this subject, let alone 60 minutes. Thank you, Maggie. I always need more time. I do. So thank you. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> <I'm leaving. laughs> I, we have a very interesting message here from a dear friend of mine that she's actually registered already in, in, in our post summit course. Uh, her name is Dr. Marta Barbosa Augusto. She's a technical director of a, a community pharmacy here and she's going to, going to be with us. She's already registered. In the, in the post summit course. And she's asking you, uh, Tom, uh, like in your opinion, Dr. Tom, should we restrict gluten in kids' diets? 
of course, you, you already answered that, right? When you talked about your kids. Well, pediatricians, she says, pediat pediatricians recommend start giving gluten after six months. Um, there's two parts to the answer. The first part is I never, ever say everyone should give up gluten. I will not say that because that sounds fanatical. But if you have a health concern that's not being answered completely, everyone should be tested to see if your immune system is fighting wheat. If your immune system is fighting wheat, yes, you give it up because your immune system is using its precious energy trying to protect you from something it considers a toxin. Now, why does it consider it a toxin? That's the second part of the answer. Every human, and I will have five studies on Sunday that will show this, and Professor Fasano talks about it. He's the one that really brought this information out to many of us. Every human, when they eat wheat, and the poorly digested wheat comes out of the stomach into the first part of the small intestine, we have sentries standing guard to protect us in the first part of the small intestine. Why? You have the same body as your ancestor thousands of years ago. Same kidneys, same liver, same gallbladder, same immune system, same digestive system, and everything works the same. Our ancestors would look for food. They'd find some food. They would smell it, taste it, then they'd eat it. If there was bad bacteria on that food, it's the job of hydrochloric acid in the stomach to kill that bacteria. But if it did not kill the bacteria and the bacteria comes out of the stomach into the first part of the small intestine, there are sentries standing guard there looking to see are there any bacteria trying to get in? If they see bacteria, they fire a chemical bullet that destroys the bacteria, creates inflammation, destroying the bacteria. That those sentries standing guard are called toll-like receptor four. There are nine toll-like receptors. Toll-like receptor four protects you against bugs. That's its job, bacteria, bugs. So if our ancestors ate something and the acid in the stomach didn't kill it, it came out of the stomach into the first part of the small intestine, the sentry standing guard then protecting you fires its chemical bullets, creates the inflammation that destroys the bug. The second thing that the sentry does, it sends a message to make more protein called zonulin. That's the protein that causes leaky gut. Increase zonulin, the, the gut opens up, water comes into the gut, and it acts like a garden hose. And you know how you put your thumb over a garden hose to wash the driveway, wash the mud off the driveway? That's what increased zonulin, water comes into the intestine to wash out the bug. So the bug can got grab on the inside of the intestine. So the toll-like receptor four does two things. It increases zonulin, water comes in to wash out the bug in, in the bowel movement, and it, it fires chemical bullets to destroy the bug. Every human that eats wheat activates toll-like receptor four in the first part of the small intestine. Every human. So then people, when they hear this and you see the studies, then you say, well, shouldn't everyone give up wheat? Shouldn't every human give up wheat? But I can't say that because I'm trying to carry the message out and I cannot sound like a fanatic. I can just talk about the science, right? So if your immune system says you got a problem here because some people have tolerance, meaning they don't get the leaky gut. The message to open up the tight junctions is very quick and then the gut heals again. So if you have not lost tolerance and your immune system is not fighting wheat, you might be okay in eating wheat. But I can tell you from the testing, we now have very accurate testing. And from the testing, the numbers are eight or nine out of 10 people. When you do the right kind of test, come back and your immune system's fighting wheat.
eight or nine out of yeah. ten. It's that's very one rare. of the parts. Sorry yeah. to interrupt you. That's one of the questions that I would like to ask you, uh, following your answer to Marta, which is. Uh, okay, if we are fighting or not fighting to eat, we can diagnose it by the tests, okay? But what, what are, when we talk about children and your kid and the way like you treat him and you want to care and keep him safe, how can we, uh, fathers and mothers, take care of our children and paying attention to the first symptoms or signs that a child can transmit you uh, when they are fighting with, like you mentioned, what are the first signs that according to your clinical experience and practice, you can alert us and to Marta because she's a mother too. And I think she might be doing this question also as a pharmacy, but, but, but most part of it because she's a mother. What can we, can we must be more uh, alert to, to that? Right, that's a very good question. And it's really hard to, um, because people think yeah. You know, you, you look to the stomach and you look for abdominal complaints. In Italy, they have 36 offices, medical offices, that have been designated as gluten-related disorder centers. And if a doctor has a patient who they think has a wheat problem or a gluten problem, they send them to one of these offices. Because if you get a diagnosis from one of these offices of having a problem with wheat, whether it's celiac or not, your food is a tax deduction. So the local pediatrician, the local general practitioner will send people to one of the gastroenterology, I think it's 26 gastroenterology offices, four or five pediatric, a couple of psychiatric offices. They're all over the country of Italy. And it doesn't matter what discipline it is. You send your patient to that clinic and they get a diagnosis of gluten sensitivity. Their food is a tax deduction. So those 36 offices pooled all their information together and they published a paper. And they said, when referrals come to us, meaning these are sick people and the doctor suspects maybe there's a problem with wheat, when they come to us, 7% of those people have celiac disease. 93% have gluten sensitivity. So by the vast majority of people that have gluten sensitivity do not have gut problems. They have brain problems. So it may be brain fog or attention deficit. They have fatigue. They have muscle aches. They have joint pain. They have skin problems. They have psoriasis. They don't have gut problems. So it's very difficult to say what symptoms do you look for in children because it could be any symptoms. It could be anything. I just showed you the study when we started here, 86,000 children that they followed in Denmark for 15 years. And if they ate 10 grams a day of gluten, which is somewhere around yes, three or four slices yes. of bread, they had a 46% yes. increased chance of Obviously. developing type 1 diabetes. Diabetes, type 1, yeah. You know, so there is no one set of symptoms to look for. It's really the testing that you have to do. Thank you, answer is perfect. If not, Marta, you will be able to put more quest questions to Dr. Tom on the next Sunday, since you are in the post-summit course. <laughs> we have another question here from Ruth Jones. Uh, she's asking, is there a way to determine, determine if a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis may possibly be mold toxicity instead? I have heard mold could mimic MS. Is this true? How would you test one versus the other? MRI brain scans diagnosed as MS. Very good question. And um, one of our guest faculty this coming weekend is Dr. Terry Walls, who is the go-to person in the world for multiple sclerosis. And as some of you know, Dr. Walls was my guest here three weeks ago on Facebook Live. So to the person that asked that question, come this weekend, uh, if you can, or watch on live stream. And you also can go back three weeks ago and Dr. Walls and I talked for an hour and we talked about mold there also. And yes, mold can mimic the symptoms of MS, yes. Perfect. 
Well, I think we have answered all the questions. Uh, Karen has a question. I have mast cell activation syndrome. That means that her immune system reacts very aggressively and it's very sensitive. It can overreact. Ah, Karen, I didn't see. My immunologist wants to give me COVID Pfizer vax in 10% increments, waiting 30 minutes in between and waiting for hopefully no reactions. Is it advised to detox after the vaccines? Use microbiome labs, mega IgG, perhaps to minimize delayed reactions, or will that interfere with vax efficiency? No, it will not interfere with uh, the reported vax efficiency. Uh, Professor Schoenfeld, who is coming this weekend, the godfather of autoimmunity, just published a paper and he shows that the antibodies to this current vaccine that are the antibodies that are produced from this current vaccine cross react with 27 different proteins in the female reproductive system. So um, maybe it's the pro the genes, the genes determine, you know, which egg comes every month when a woman ovulates uh, and proteins are the messengers for that. So the egg bursts and it, it starts to ripen or if impregnated, then the egg, the fertilized egg has to implant on the wall. There's different proteins for that. 27 of these different proteins in the female reproductive system can be, the, the antibodies to the vaccine can attack those 27 different proteins. It's called molecular mimicry. We are going to have a very big problem. We already have a big problem with infertility but it's going to get a lot worse because so many millions are getting this vaccine that's never been tested on humans before. And now we're seeing the results of some of this uh, months and months later. So uh, to your question, Karen, if you've got mast cell activation syndrome, I would be cautious about how you get the vaccine. Okay, um, let's see. Ruth says, is there a way to determine if a diagnosis goes to me? Oh, okay, we, we did that one, thank you. Already? Thank you so yes. much. My gosh, it's six o'clock Six o'clock here. It's been an hour already. It's been an hour. <laughs> it just goes too fast. So Time flies, is, time well, flies. Please share with your friends and family about this weekend, this conference this weekend, wherever you are in the world, it's going to be live stream. And there may be one speaker that you listen to that just changes the course of your health. And you'll look back 10, 15 years from now and be grateful for the level of health you have and how you've been aging and say, you know, I'm really glad that I listened to that, that one speaker, whether it's Dr. Walls or the representative from uh, 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 to World, to World Health Organization. World Health Organization, thank you, I just went blank. Or Dr. Fasano or Dr. Schoenfeld or whoever. Schoenfeld, Muril Pereira from Brazil, the nutritionist, the nutritionist super uh, expert on, 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 on gut and modulation and my God. <laughs> yes, so, so many to learn from. We are very excited about this weekend and everything that's happening. And we hope that you'll find the time to join us. The link is here for that. Thank you all very much. Jean Pedro, thank you so much for being here tonight. Pleasure. Your Have a nice trip. Thank we you. are waiting for you. <laughs> thank you. All right, everyone. Thank you so much. See you next week. Goodbye, everyone. Bye -bye. Thank you.